and Native Americans, this was a big part of their diet was white oak. 24, 16, then you grade it by class, one, two, three, or four. Yeah. Oh my gosh, are you serious? See, old, old time farmers, they didn't think trees had any value because you find a lot of what it would have been a good veneer tree, most valuable tree to sell in Illinois. Veneer, that's, that's gold. That's what goes, that's the part you see on the furniture. He offered him $20,000, I got him $92,000. The forester, Terry? Terry Wheeler, yes. Terry Wheeler, all right. So you checked out the first parcel? Right, that's a south facing slope, shallow soil, very poor. Wouldn't matter what you did in there, you're not gonna grow very much or very many big trees. Hard to grow trees on rock. South slope is the least desirable to grow good trees because the angle of sunlight hits it. A north facing slope will average three to four degrees cooler than the south slope will. So you have typically have richer soils. You're growing northern red oak, white oak, more viable species. They'll migrate to that. A south slope, you're gonna go at post oak, blackjack oak, black oak, hickory, you know, less desirable, less valuable trees. And the shallower the soil, the slower it's gonna grow, the less potential. Okay. And the Shawnee in this area down here, pioneers came in here and tried to farm this, believe it or not. Okay. So when they plowed it up and they worked it up, it washed down the hill and down the river and out the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. So that's why you have a lot of, it's highly erodible land with you know steep inclines. You have a lot of gullies and a lot of bare exposed rock. So that soil doesn't really have any potential to grow much timber. Mm -hmm. That would be a place you could plant pine, and they could help to rebuild the soil, mm -hmm. break up the soil profile. So, was there anything that you'd harvest in that area? Very little. Mm -hmm. you, any, any of the high dollar buyers, they're not interested in stuff like that. Okay. You know, because they have fixed costs bringing the equipment out here. Right. Mm -hmm. Labor costs, workers comp, that they don't want to drag sticks, they want to yeah. drag big trees. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Cool. Well, so we're going to start marking today. Right. Yeah, okay. and I want, I want, I'm glad that you're here with me. I always like to have landowners present yeah. because I'm not the tail that wags the dog. It's your timber. Yeah. You're under no obligation. If you like, you will tell me what your management goals are and your objectives, and then we'll mark accordingly. I don't mark clear cuts. If that's what you want, you know, you'd have to get somebody else because stewardship is a big part of what I do. Yeah. I'm going to be 70 years old this summer, and I don't want to leave the world worse than I found. I want to try to make things better. Okay. So, Super. Through good selective timber harvest, you can do it. They'll tell average volume per tree and total number of board, board footage of that species. So they're going to read this sheet. If they see that it averages less than, say, 280 foot per tree, they don't want it. They want ideally 300 foot or more board foot per tree average. On the sale, that gets their attention, gets them excited. So, so you're saying more trees that are closer to the 20 might actually not be as good a bid with you, less trees and bigger trees? You can, right. You can kill your sale if you start marking very many 20 inch diamond trees. Okay. To get a 300 board foot tree on a 24 foot by 24 uh, inch diamond. So diameter breast height, four and a half foot off the ground on the high side of the tree. You want 24 inch diameter. This is a Biltmore stick. It's kind of like a yardstick, but as you notice, it's not a yardstick to get closer to the tree. Right. It tells you the diameter. You check it two places around the tree, 90 degrees yeah. off, in case you have an ovate-shaped tree, then you average the two numbers. Okay. If it's you know, circular, then you just use the one number. Market stuff will go into crane mats and pallets, pallet lumber. Then there's grade furniture, I mean grade quality, that goes into furniture like the backing of the table. Let's say you buy a walnut table. Odds are it's not solid walnut. It's a veneer of walnut, a thin piece of walnut that's glued on the top of it on some other type of wood underneath it. Maybe ash or you know, some other you know, better quality wood. Okay. So grades the mid-level. Each level you go up, you get a higher price per board foot. And each species uh, determines the price per board foot. Veneer, that's, that's gold. That's what goes, that's the part you see on the furniture. For instance, there's one walnut, walnut log sold in Illinois two years ago up in Peoria. And one buyer came from Japan to buy that one tree. It brought $40,000 for one walnut in the tree. When I was going to forestry school at Southeastern, 
College in Harrisburg. Well, that, that's there was a walnut log on the Indiana side of the Big Wabash. It was in 1992. One 40 foot log brought $30,000. In 92? And it went to London, England. One 40 foot log. And what veneer is, they'll take that log, they'll chuck it in a giant lathe, they'll spin it around once they debark it, they'll bring this blade in as they spin it, and they'll peel off a real thin layer of it. So that one log can make gobs and gobs of veneer. And to be veneer, it has to be flawless wood. That means no knots. It has to be good, perfect grain. Nothing metallic like some people put nails in trees we've seen out here in the years past for deer stands. Yeah. Or you see old fence rows and the wire. That root, You can't get veneer that will want any, any tree if you have metal. In it. It'll put a blue dye that goes up through the tree. Okay. You know, runs it, then it goes down to the bottom level. Okay. Bottom cross. All right, uh, Terry's going to lead the way. Three of us are going to hike. Terry says he's got a lot of metal in his body. I said, no, we might have something to come. Here's an example of how good, what could have been a good walnut log is ruined. Oh, Spike nail, and the nails up there from an old built-in deer. Tree. And that's a walnut. A walnut. Gee. I had one buyer tell me one time, he said, that walnut is the cocaine of the floor. That makes us all go crazy. Yeah, yeah that's a pain. Yeah, you get... Let's say Penno, if you have Penno because we drove in here. Market price today, it'll typically bring a sale 25 to 30 cents per board foot. Walnut, it can go 12, 14, 15 dollars a board foot and up. Okay. So it's, it's sad to see any tree when they. Yeah, I know, that is sad. I am looking at a changing a four wheeler. That's a whole nother story, but I'm kind of looking at how many logs. It'll go into crane mats. This one's just an eight foot log. It'll go into pallet load. So we take and measure 26 inches that way. So uh, this is a honey loafer. Honey loafer. It has the bean pods on it. Okay. So the big thorns. You get 24 that way, so it's 26, 24, you average them. You always average it down. 25 is the average, you go down to 24. Okay. You always round down in favor of your buyer. Okay. You want to be fair to the landowner, but you don't want to short your buyer because it's the difference in making and breaking a sale for him. He has to make money out here, he won't buy any more of your sales. Okay. So this is 24 inch diameter. It has. Yeah, you count eight foot log segments. How many eight foot logs in the tree? Here's one, two there. So it's 24, 16. Then you grade it by class one, two, three, or four. Class one is no defect. Class two means one 10% deduction. It has a little bit of sweep to it. That means it's not perfectly straight. No. So when they saw that log, they're going to lose some. Volume on this side and that side till they get it, you know, cylindrical, so they cut boards out of it. So we'll make this a class two. Okay. Class three is a 25 percent deduction. Class four is a live cull. You don't sell those. Okay. You leave them or cut them down. This honey locust. You'll see the bean pods on the ground and the seeds. See this bean pod? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got tangled in these before. Oh, they are low to the ground. And they'll flatten your tires. Yep. So we take corn marking paint. This is a special paint I buy from ForestrySuppliers.com, okay. and it'll last for several years. Because if you decide to sell this timber any sale I mark, I provide a four-page contract. I had a lawyer draw it for me years ago, protects the buyer and the seller. And the, the term of the contract is two years from the date of closing. Right. So you want this paint to be nice and visible two years from now, right. okay. so they know which trees to cut. Okay. We mark. Only the trees to be cut. Yeah. I mark three places around the trunk for visibility, so it's easy for the buyer to walk through the woods and see. Okay. You only have one dot; he's going to miss a lot of trees, or you're going to walk him to death trying to find out where they're at. Okay. Three around the bowl, one at the stump at ground level, okay. below where he's going to cut and catch a tree off. He's going to cut up here. Yep. The reason I put that there 
Also, my contract, I will come out and do surprise inspections as the harvest is underway. Okay. And I walk through the woods, if I see stumps and tree just cut down that doesn't have orange paint on it, I know he stole the tree. Then I shut him down, and then we'll go to arbitration and get it all settled, or he loses the sale. And he forfeits the money he's paid for. So this keeps him on us. So obviously, too, like I asked Michael, let's say it was a crooked thing, but that's why I'm working with you guys, because you know a lot of these loggers and that. So if he were to come and mark one, I'm going to guess that you'd have an idea, um, like what kind of sizes and that you mark. So let's say there's one you didn't mark, and he wanted to take it, and he just put an orange dot at the bottom. Well, I know what tree I'm going to cut, because as I walk through the woods, I'm making a forestry management decision on okay. every tree I come to. Okay. First, I'll look around. I'll see this is not a desirable species. We're not worried about regenerating this. We want to get this species out of your woods. Yeah. Because of the, the market's not it's not a valuable woods, and you don't want these thorns growing everywhere. The only advantage to these is it might appeal to you. Deer love these pods and right. beans because they're high in sugar, so they'll they'll feed on them. But I can tell if I see a stump, and I can tell that's a honey locust. I don't care if he did steal it, but I can tell if it's big enough, I mark it. Okay. You know, because I want to get rid of one of those. Because I see. A white oak stump, and there's only one white oak, and there's none in the area. And we're not trying to just generate income, we're trying right. to generate white oak. Right. Even though that's a valuable tree and he wants to buy it, I'll leave it. Right. And if it's healthy, that way in the next sale down the road, the tree's still there. But in the meantime, it propagate and regenerate your woods in a desirable species. 24-16-1, honey locust. Right down the species, 24-inch diameter, 16-foot log, class 1. Or no, it's class two. Class two. Class two. Then when I get home, I have a computer program. I'll get this notepad out. I'll enter all the data in. It'll spit out and tell me how many trees I have of each species, total number of board footage of that species, average volume per tree of that species. Then I'll print up a sale announcement sheet. It'll tell how many, what the total volume of the sale is, the total number of trees per sale, and the average volume per tree of the sale of all the species combined. It'll tell how many acres in the sale, a legal description of property, the name of the landowner, uh, driving directions from some state highway, mm -hmm. the nearest state highway to the property. It tells them conditions of the of what's being sold. For instance, I include in all my sales that any ash tree, even though none marked, they can cut if they want to. And included in the sale because of an invasive insect the emerald ash borer has devastated ash trees across north america mm -hmm. there are still a few ash trees you can find that are still alive but i'm not going to count them in a sale because in that two-year span of the contract once the bug hits them they're worthless mm -hmm. other than firewood so i'm not going to gamble with the buyer's money if he wants to that's his prerogative but i don't feel it's ethical for me to do that so i just tell them if they want ash trees they can cut them any dead tree any down tree they can cut yeah. you know to get those out of your woods this is the tree that we'll want to mark for your sale this is a white oak. Okay. This tree is 24 inches that way, 26 that way, so it's 24. And the reason I go two places is to make sure that it's not overweight. So I want to get an average of the okay. diameter of the tree. So it's 24 inch by 8 by 16. So it's a 24 16, and there's no sweep on either of the two 8 foot logs. So this is a class 1. So it's a white oak 24-16-1. And I'm going to take this tree out because next to it, we have another nut producing white oak that will help to regenerate this area. Yep. And there are other younger white oaks. Plus behind us, we have a young walnut tree that we want to grow here. Okay. So you always, as I say, you make a forestry management decision, each tree you approach as to whether it should come out or not. So as far as the walnut goes, uh, when you say young one, that is it that like 18 inch or over there? Right. So, and I'm just playing both sides of the fence, looking at it. If it's just a sheer financial investment, 
A, what would that tree bring income the way it sits? Would people buy it or would, would they just not because it's too small? That tree right now would bring you maybe $40, $50. Oh, gosh. If you wait, if you wait 10 years, that tree could be 500 could be 1000 Okay. You can't make interest on your money in the bank if you take that $50, cut it down. Yeah, invest. right, right. It's making you more money here than you'll ever make in any investment. Okay. It's, it's like a 16-year-old boy is just hitting the stride where it's really growing and really going to perform. Okay, makes so, sense. You don't want to pick green tomatoes, to use an analogy of the garden. Okay. You want to make make sure you're picking ripe tomatoes. Okay. I mean, green tomatoes are good, but ripe ones are better. No, I, I don't like tomatoes, but I get it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so again, next thing we do, we take a hammer on each tree. We hit it. Sound it out. In my ears, if you do enough of this year, you'll learn what a hollow tree sounds like. Or what okay. One, so you check the integrity log, make sure there's no cavity in it. That tree's solid. So we'll paint it on three sides. If it's a hollow tree, you don't mark it. No matter how big it is, no matter what species it is, you leave it because it's hollow. It's, hollow. it's worthless. And not just worthless, if they go to cut in a hollow tree, you can get somebody killed. Because this tree, you cut your wedge out, you do your, your back cut, you drop it down, and you know how to keep it off of you. you know, we hope. A hollow tree, it won't work that way. You know, this will do the timber and a slow fall. A hollow tree can explode and crash down on top of you because all it's holding it is the outer part of the tree. So there's no heartwood to make it go down slow. Once you start weakening this, the rest of it can't support it and it comes, it comes straight down and you get people killed. So that's another reason you want to check. Now we'll go find the next tree. That's a 20? That's a little less, less than 20. Than, okay. 20. We don't want to mark anything below 20. Okay. I'm not lazy, but I had a tree fall on me 13 years ago, and Michael Brenner, my cousin, was with me when it happened, when they put me in a helicopter. Should have died. I was in a hospital bed for 90 days on the ventilator five days, no oh. idea how many surgeries. My left boot was by my cheek with my foot in it. My right boot was as bad behind me. Oh. I had a big hickory fall down on top of me. And I have two rods and a plate, a rod and two plates and a plate in my back. Wow. And crushed my rib cage. Anyway, long story short, I don't do any walking if I don't have to. No, I don't <laughs> On these steep you. slopes, I can get off and do it, but I can't walk real far or real long. Right. Pointing at, at trees as he's going through ones that he wants to stop and check. Looks like another white oak. This is a godsend, this Onyx hunt map. Yep. Prior to this, you had to use a compass, oh an aerial God. photograph. And you had to do a lot of walking. The first thing you did was spend a day or two just marking your boundaries. Wow. And you had to find some defined property line to start at. You may have to start a long way off. <laughs> this this is a, I'm sure you use this. Yep, yep. Very accurate, shows you your location, where you're at, shows you the property lines. Yep. So we always want to make sure that we're staying on the property that's being sold, the timber. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to crowd property lines. This is fairly accurate but we don't want to get too close because the value of the tree that you're marking is probably not worth the cost in litigation if you have a boundary dispute with right. your neighbor. Yeah. Plus you don't want bad relations with your neighbors. Yep, I would agree 100%. Most valuable tree to sell in Illinois. The most valuable is walnut. White oak is the state tree? Yeah, state tree of Illinois is okay. white oak. I did not know that, so learn. Yeah, they have state tree, state bird, state fish, you know, all kind of things. But it, you're always glad to see a white oak. And this is a good wildlife tree. Uh, White-tailed deer and turkey love white oak acorns. And Native Americans, this was a big part of their diet was white oak. Wow. Because it's low in tannin, they would blanch the acorn. They'd boil in a pot of water because they had tannin in them. And if you eat an acorn without blanching it, getting the tannin out, it'll shut your liver down. 
Wow. But they learned, I guess, the hard way, you know, not to do that. But they would blanch them, pour the water off that had the tannin in it, let them dry. Then they would crack the nut open, you know, the shell open, get the nut out, and they would grind it with a mortar and a pestle, and they made food out of it. And it was high nutrition. So Native Americans were the first foresters because they, for at least 2,000 years, the University of Pennsylvania did a study for at least 2,000 years before the white people came, Native Americans did prescribe burning to promote oaks. If you want to grow white oaks and oaks have an oak hickory forest, you have to use fire. You have to work at it. If you just let this property go without doing anything to it, you'll end up with beach, uh, beech and maple and mm -hmm. poplar and trees that are not beneficial to wildlife. And so to have this, you can thank the Native Americans, you know, or, or the people here before our ancestors came. That's why we have so many oaks. Wow, that's interesting. Man, I want to go for a ride in the woods with the players. Stuff in trees? Uh-huh. So look at this. Oh my gosh, are you serious? See, old-time old farmers, they didn't think trees had any value because this place was covered with trees. And they hadn't seen any fence posts, they hadn't been invented yet, so they used trees for their posts. Or they'd have to split a rail and make a post. So you find a lot of what would have been a good veneer tree wow. wasted. Now it's good for well, power. What about uh, like, you know, yeah, they we'll get took an eight foot log that. out of it. Okay. Yeah. But you have to mark above the wire because right. that will ruin their saw at the mill. Yeah. So we'll count from here up to there, we get one eight foot log. 26, 30, so be 28 inches diameter, eight foot long, class one. It's white oak. Record the dating, go paint the tree and go to the next one. The main stem is 24 foot, then there's 16 foot in that fork to the left. So anything you measure down to 14 inches diameter on the small end of the log, that's what you mark. So you're saying there's 40 feet of log, of log in, that tree. in that one. That's all log. Being a deer hunter, you, you can pretty well guess what eight foot is and 16 foot by how high you put your deer stand. Yeah, yep. If you guess it, I mean, if you guess it 22 foot, let's say we think that's not quite 24, then you go down to 16. You always round down. Okay. You don't try to ever stretch it up bigger than what it is. Okay. If you're confident that's a good 24 foot, and then there's 16, there's two 8 foot sections in that limb to the left. So we've got a 40 foot log in that tree. Nice. The bottom log will make veneer. The bottom 8 foot, yep. that'd be a defect, and those other will not from the pad and the pad. But where there's no, that's, a, that's you got an eight foot veneer log. As I said, veneer is worth more than grade. The bottom's grade, I mean, the top is grade, the bottom's veneer. Okay. This bottom's veneer, the whole top is grade. So on a hollow tree, I won't mark it, you just don't see a big tree that's left. Okay. If it's a desirable species, like if you get Michael to come and do timber stand improvement following the harvest, if it's a big tree that's, say, a white oak that I've left that's hollow, he will probably leave that if he doesn't have adequate, adequate regeneration. It'll never be worth anything to sell, but it's making a lot of young stems you need to grow up and take its place. Okay. If he has a bunch of young white oak underneath it, he'll kill it. But he knows when he, if he starts cutting into it and then he feels that there's a cavity, he will probably try to be real careful and not have the thing fall down on him. So he'll probably just try to kill the tree. All you gotta do is get to the cambium layer. You can spray it. When he does his process, he carries around Tordon in a spray bottle. Yep. He can just cut that around. It's called hack and squirt. So you can get the, the herbicide to the cambium layer. That's, that's like our veins. That's what carries the food to the tree from the roots up the rest of the stem. So you penetrate the outer bark to the cambium layer. You put the herbicide on it, Tordon, and it'll kill the whole tree and kill the roots and everything. And you don't have to worry about it falling down trying to run chainsaw. You just let nature take its course. And once it dies, a white oak stump can last 40 to 45 years. 
So you're gonna have a hollow tree that woodpeckers are gonna come in, make cavities. And the Shawnee down here, you have these pileated woodpeckers. Yeah. They'll make a cavity big enough when they're done nesting in it, a squirrel can live in it. So you have a wildlife hotel. Coons nest in them, uh, opossums, flying squirrels, all kinds of things that use you know, dead trees for cavities. Okay, the way we'll do this sale, after I get it marked, I get it all tallied up, and I print up the sale announcement sheet, I'll send it to a lit timber buyers who are licensed in the state of Illinois. If they don't have a minimum $10,000 bond with the state of Illinois, I don't send them sheets. They're required to have a minimum $1 million liability insurance policy to protect the seller. They're required to pay workers' comp to their employees to protect the seller. Uh, they have two weeks to come out before the sale closes at 5 p.m. on whatever day the closing it'll be. They can inspect the timber. Some of these buyers have dealt with me for decades. They know my scale. They'll bid off my sheet without seeing it. Others may not. Uh, I'll be sending to buyers in four states because there's white oak in this. They'll come farther for white oak. They do. A, they have one chance to buy this. It's a seal bid auction. Okay. So it takes out all the guesswork. I've had sales where I've had $38,000 difference from the top bid to the second bid. If I did a live auction, which some foresters do, you would have got $37,500 less. You know, they bid just enough to get it, they, but they bid the, the most they can afford to pay and still make money. They know they got one shot at it. Okay, I'm gonna get all the bids in at 5 p.m. I'll contact you, the seller. I'll tell you what all the bids are. You're still under no obligation to sell. I state that in the sale announcement sheet that we reserve the right to accept or reject any or all bids. If you're agreeable to sell, it will set up a time of closing. They'll write you a check for 50% of that amount. They'll pay you a check for 50% of the amount day of closing, and then before they move in to start the sale, they'll write the check for the remaining 50%, so you're paid 100% in full before they ever cut the first tree. And you know how much you're going to get. Mistakes landowners have made typically over the years is selling on shares. That's the worst thing you can do. That's saying, trust me, I won't rip you off. And unfortunately, a lot of them, a lot of them in the past have been ripped off. Uh, it's an old scam. They say, well, it's kind of like sharecropping. When I get done with the harvest, I will bring you the receipts from the mill that I take the trees to, and I'll give you a third, and I'll keep two-thirds or whatever percentage they offer you. The problem is you don't know how many loads he took to a different mill, or he kept on his own yard, or he just didn't show you all the receipts from yeah. that mill and you get ripped off. Plus you're letting the sell, the buyer manage your timber. He's not coming out here and thinking about 10 years, 20 years down the road, what your timber is gonna be like. He's gonna leave you a thicket. He's gonna cut anything he can sell, set up a mill and rape your woods. And in your lifetime, you'll never have another, another sale. In an upland setting, every 20, 25 years, you should have a sale. In a lowland setting, every 10, 15 years, you should have a sale. Plus you'll have good nice mature timber throughout the whole time. You'll have good wildlife habitat the whole time. You'll be leaving it better than you found it when you leave this world. And stewardship is important to landowners. It's important to me. I'm a Christian. I think we should be good stewards, whatever we have in, input on, you know, throughout our lives. So I will contact you, but I started to tell you, you're going to have people coming here on your property during the next right. two weeks after I mark this to come out and walk through the woods. So be prepared for that. Okay. And then I'll call and let you know what the bids are, and then it's your decision whether you want to buy or sell. If you do want to sell, my fee is 10% of what the sale brings. People think, well, that's a lot of money. I could eliminate you. You're no necessary middleman. If you don't have competition in an auction, you're not going to get market price. Market price is what the high bidder is willing to pay the day of the closing. And each bidder will pay a different price for that tree throughout a year, according to his market demands. How many he has bought up, or if he's about cut all the timber he has bought up and he's trying to keep his employees busy, he'll pay more money because he doesn't want to lay his employees off and lose his workers. Or he's got a really good contract that he needs timber you know, to fill that contract on. So one landowner down at Nishani Town, a timber buyer went in and approached him, wanted to see if he could sell his timber. This is just north of Old Shawnee Town. 
He offered him $20,000 and he marked everything down to 14 inches diameter. He called me. I marked down to 20 inches diameter and very few, most of them was bigger, that I left. I got him $92,000. So he paid my 10% and still came out $62,000 ahead by using me. So kind of is a necessary middleman unless you want to get ripped off. Plus he still has a better woods and that guy was going to leave him. That's why you guys are here. <laughs>